Good evening. Welcome to worship at Trinity this evening. Uh, my name, for those of you who haven't met me yet, my name is Ryan Colander. I serve as your senior vicar, senior assistant, ministry assistant, uh, reaching out to the Hispanic community in Waukesha. Uh, it's a joy to be here worshiping with you this evening. This weekend marks a special weekend and day here at Trinity. It's our Ministry Sunday weekend. Uh, it, it's a day, may, perhaps you read in the welcome, in the welcome note in the bulletin, a day when we get to celebrate and thank God for all the people who serve in some way here at Trinity uh, to help with the ministry. As part of that celebration, we welcome Pastor James Borgwart to preach this evening. He's a pastor in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, and he is a son of the congregation. So a special chance to hear a son of the congregation preach this evening. With that, may God bless your worship. We'll begin with the very first hymn, hymn 538. Please stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. We have come into the presence of God, who created us to love and serve Him as His dear children. But we have disobeyed Him and deserve only His wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to Him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, 
I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Let us pray. Almighty God, look with favor on those whom you have called to minister to your people. Fill them with faithfulness to your doctrine and clothe them with holiness of life that they may joyfully serve to the glory of your name and for the benefit of your church. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. May be seated. Our first lesson for this evening comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 52, verses 4 through 10. Proclaiming the gospel is a beautiful thing. For this is what the Sovereign Lord says. At first, my people went down to Egypt to live. Lately, Assyria has oppressed them. And now, what do I have here? declares the Lord. For my people have been taken away for nothing, and those who rule them mock, declares the Lord. And all day long my name is constantly blasphemed. Therefore my people will know my name. Therefore in that day they will know that it is I who foretold it. Yes, it is I. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. Listen, your watchmen lift up their voices. Together they shout for joy. When the Lord returns to Zion, they will see it with their own eyes. 
burst into songs of joy together, you ruins of Jerusalem, for the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord will lay bare his holy arm in the sight of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. This is the word of our Lord. We'll sing the Psalm of the Day, Psalm 19. Note the congregation sings the refrains marked in bold type. Our second lesson comes from the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, verses 7 and 8. Obey your leaders who proclaim the word to you. Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no advantage to you. This is the word of our Lord.
for the reading of the gospel. Our gospel comes from John chapter 6, verses 5 through 10. Jesus tests the disciples with an impossible task. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test them, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Eight months' wages could not buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and the men sat down, about 5,000 of them. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated.
in the name of Jesus Christ, who is the same yesterday and today and forever, dear brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. Don't know much about history. You may recognize that as the first line of a top 10 hit from the 1960s. It's called A Wonderful World. The artist was Sam Cooke, and in that song, he sang about the fact that in school he wasn't doing so well in a lot of the subjects. Didn't know much about history, didn't know much about biology, or about the French he took, and on and on. And he explains why. Because he had these, his eyes on this girl, and it didn't bother him so much that he couldn't focus on his school subjects because he figured as long as this would-be girlfriend could return his affection, then he reasoned, oh, what a wonderful world this would be. I don't know if his girlfriend appreciated his logic, but I would guess that his teachers did not. The master teacher was and is constantly dealing with distracted students. When you look over the course of Jesus' three-year ministry, Jesus is working especially with these 12 men. We could consider them seminary students. He was leading them on this three-year traveling seminary. And as a master teacher, he would do what many teachers do. He would dispense knowledge in a variety of ways. In order to communicate to these men, to his students, more about how God works in his kingdom in this world, he would tell stories that they could relate to. He would often work one-on-one, -on -one, individually, with, with people like Nicodemus or Zacchaeus in order to personalize his instruction. We could say that he lectured, or better yet, he preached sermons in order to explain more fully the will of God. And to check on comprehension, Jesus would give tests. On a particular lesson that we look at this evening from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 6, it's about halfway through these disciples' seminary training. And Jesus figured as he saw over 5,000 hungry people coming towards him, not just to listen, but also wondering where they're going to find something to eat, Jesus figured this is a, a perfect opportunity for a one-question pop quiz. And so he turns to one of his pupils by the name of Philip. We're told when Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Sounding almost like he was asking for advice, Jesus, of course, knew what he was planning to do. He knew how he would feed this multitude of people. But as a good teacher, he wanted to see how his student would work through this problem on his own. How would he take the things that he had learned from his instructor? How would he uh, apply them, th these lessons he had learned about faith, uh, about his teacher? And on what base of knowledge will, would Philip base his answer? Now, when we look at what his answer is, we see it in verse 7. Philip answered him, eight months' wages would not buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Well, it's clear. Philip understood economics well, the, the law of supply and demand. He knew that in the disciples' collective wallets, there was not enough supply to even provide an appetizer for this multitude of people. Okay. So if this were an economics test, Philip would have passed. The problem is it wasn't an economics test. This was a Bible history test, and Philip failed. Philip failed to remember when God had faced a much larger multitude of people, not 5, 10, 20,000 on that Galilean hillside, but 2 million Israelites in a desert for 40 years, and how God provided miraculously manna from heaven to feed those people who followed Moses' leadership in the wilderness. He, he didn't go back to his Saturday school lessons where he could have remembered that, yeah, that's right, Elijah had, uh, he, he had turned this water that, that was 
not drinkable, into potable, drinkable water, or, or where Elisha fed 100 men with just a handful of barley loaves. And of course, it wasn't these men who performed those miracles. It was God who did that. But wasn't that the point? <laughs> the Son of God was standing within arm's reach of Philip, and he didn't get it. And the funny thing is, is even if Philip didn't go back to his Bible history for the answer to Jesus' test question, he could have used current events, right? I mean, he was one of these men who had the privilege of witnessing Jesus healing broken bodies, of sending demons, de these demonic spirits, out of people. How, well, he would even witness Jesus raise the dead back to life. And yet, when Jesus brings a question of how they are going to find food for all these people to eat. Philip could not think about, well, yeah, the Son of God is standing right here. Instead, he, could, he realized or he thought that, you know, there's no Piggly Wiggly around with double coupon Thursdays. Now we have another disciple, Andrew, who, who steps up. He must have heard the question, and so he wanted to, to take this test too. We see in verse 8, another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? You know that Andrew was Jesus' first disciple. He would have been in the seminary program for the longest time, and yet he showed that he wasn't doing so well in history either. Uh, he understood arithmetic, right? He realized that if you take five loaves of bread, two small fish, and you divide them among 5,000 families, that that equals a lot of hungry people left over. That's good math, but this was bad Bible history. Two disciples tested, and we could say two failing grades. How about you? Do you like tests that God sends you in life? And I mean about life tests, but maybe some of you think about tests that you get in, in school, which I guess we could talk about that too. When I look back, uh, seven of my 21 years of formalized school training were at Trinity Lutheran School. Most of the faces of the pastors and the teachers and the staff have, have changed. Some have moved to heaven. Others have moved to Phoenix or, or some other earthly locale. But there are some who are still here. I, I remember, I think it was in a, a room downstairs a couple of building additions ago, there was, there was one of those extended classrooms when we were running out of classroom space, and, and Mr. DeNoyer was giving us one of his history tests, and in his exaggerated left-handed scrawl, he would always give them verbally, and you could almost read his answers just by seeing the big letters he was writing down on, on his sheet. I remember some of those tests, I, I don't know why so, so vividly, or I remember Pastor Maddock, who was my catechism or confirmation instructor. I sometimes remind my old, old, older siblings who had to take public examination here. Pastor Maddox didn't make us do that. I don't know why, but we were kind of thankful we didn't have that particular test in front of the, the congregation. Um, they taught us a lot of things that stuck in our heads, uh, but we were taught so much more through the pastors and teachers, just as, as you are taught here so much more. Um, from them, I learned that the, the seriousness of the Christian faith, but how it can be carried out with a very fun and lighthearted attitude, and yeah, that was Mr. D, I think. Um, Pastor Maddock, just by his example, his, his teaching, the way he carried himself, made many of us kids think about the, the pastoral ministry. But it's even more than that. They, they taught us um, information in the, the classrooms and things that are still in the head. But as they taught us God's Word or how God and His world applies to all these different aspects of our life and all these different disciplines we, we studied, the, the message, and it's because of the Holy Spirit, traveled from the head to the, the heart. And the lessons that we word through, learned through our called workers, they were the foundation, the framework by which we were able to go on after confirmation or after we got that diploma from here, from Wisco or whatever school. And we could face tests that didn't involve pencil and paper. And realize, you know what? Every one of the tests 
we face in life is a Bible history test because it's God's Word that has equipped us to face whatever is going to be in front of us. I'll just, I guess, one example. Some tests may at, at first seem to come in the form of arithmetic or market economics. Now, I don't know how you work ministry planning here at, at Trinity or, or, or budget planning. I imagine maybe you had a stewardship uh, focus in, in the fall. I know we did you know, 20 years ago when, when, when I was here. But let me ask you, how do you determine the offerings that you will give to your Lord and the part that will go through his church here where you're a member? Um, do you first write it out on, on paper, determine how it'll balance, and then when you find something at the bottom, you say, okay, I, I have something left to support the, the ministry? Of course, if you know your Bible history, you know that those are not the examples that, that God put before us. Think of the widow at Zarephath where one of God's called workers came to her, Elijah, and said, well, give me your last food that you're about to eat with your son and, and, and then die of starvation. No, first give it to me. Did that widow, did she take out her slide rule and, and kind of calculate whether she could afford that? Or did she trust the Lord and give to him first and, and know and sure enough that he would provide what she would need in life. Or how about that, that lady during Holy Week where Jesus points his now three-year seminarians toward and say, look how she puts her last two copper coins in the temple treasury to support the, the ministry. Do you think she first sat down with her Excel spreadsheet to see after the algebraic equations are all done, if she's got something to support the church. No, she gave first, and she trusted that the Lord would supply. Or Paul's example that we think of from Macedonia, how these people in a very poverty-stricken area generously supported the work that he was doing. Was it because that they understood market economics so well that they were anticipating when there'd be a bump up and their stock options would kick in and, and therefore they'd be reimbursed. No, we're told that it was out of their extreme poverty that they gave generously because they knew from their own Bible history that God supplies for his people, that, that he will take care of his own. Because they knew their history, because they knew their Lord, they passed those what seemed to be financial tests, but they were really Bible history tests. Dear fellow disciples, or students, which is what that word really means, whether you are 8 or 88, you are a student of, of Bible history for life. You might have a mind for math, an affinity for art, or a love for languages, and that is great and good, but every single one of you is a student of Bible history. Because as you go to God's Word and you use the framework that His workers here at Trinity have provided for you, you, you see that as we just read, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. So that the, the God of history who provided for his people most often naturally but also miraculously will also provide for you each and every day. And you see that your God who loves you, who did not spare his only son but, but gave him up for us all, that you realize how would he not also along with him not graciously give us all things. So that when Jesus died on the cross, he removed all of your sins. And because of his perfect life, when you open up your report card and, and you see the subjects in there, first commandment, second commandment, third commandment, it's Jesus A plus perfected, perfect life that God has given to you. And therefore, God raised him back to life. Mission accomplished, sins forgiven. And therefore, you also will rise one day. And because he ascended to God's right hand, you also will ascend there to bask in the glory of your brother and your king. And oh, what a wonderful world that will be. So whether you're a student in the classrooms here or you're taking catechism 
or your tests in life are the life tests, they will come. And Jesus will continue to let them come because you are his pupils, and he wants to see how you will work through those problems. Some might seem relational or financial, but bottom line, they're all Bible history. They are all Bible history tests. And if you have a question for how to apply God's word to what you struggle through or what are the tests in front of you, go to your teacher, go to your pastor, go to the, the staff here. For God has given them as a gift to you to equip you for works of service and to direct you in, in God's will. And as you learn that Bible history, others will look at you, every single member of Trinity Lutheran Church and School, and they will not say, oh, they're part of that biblically illiterate generation. No one will look at you and say, ah, oh, they don't know much about Bible history. But they will see people who are ready for the tests of life. And as Jesus, Brother James, wrote, Blessed is the person who perseveres under trial because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Amen. Please stand. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Together we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. I've been asked to give five announcements. Uh, announcement number one. On Sunday from 3 to 5 p.m., you're invited to Trinity's second annual tr uh, trunk or treat. Uh, it's down in the church parking lot. Uh, bring kids to dress up in costumes and receive candy in a safe and fun way. Also, uh, if, you have, if you do have time, you're able to make it. We are looking for more volunteers, not to give candy or donate candy, uh, but simply to provide your car's trunk to open up and give candy to the kids. So if you're free on Sunday from 3 to 5 p.m., uh, second annual trunk or treat. Announcement number two. Uh, a special Spanish outreach seminar is coming to Trinity on Sunday, November, I'm sorry, Saturday, November 14th uh, from 9 to 11 a.m. We get to have a missionary specialist, Tim Flunker, come in and present how we can be better welcome our neighbors. Uh, this seminar is free and for every Trinity member. And so to register, all you have to do is go to the website, trinitywells.com, and click on the news section. All right, announcement number three kind of goes hand in hand with that. Uh, the, the fall session of our English as a Second Language classes, or ESL classes, are underway. Uh, we've welcomed 22 and 21 people from our community in for those classes, the, the first two class periods, which is a great turnout, a lot of excitement, and we have some people serving very well. We could use a few more teachers, and I don't say teachers like you have to prepare something, uh, but people who are, are, if you're willing to simply make a connection with the person, sit there and help tutor them as the class is being taught, uh, you're more than welcome. The classes are on Mondays and Wednesdays from 6 to 7.30. Uh, so again, if you have some free time, you're able to help out, you'd like to help out uh, with that, you can talk to me following the service. Uh, I'd, I'd love to talk with you about it. Now some number four, final week of the power of pocket change is this week. Thank you for your support these past two weeks. Simply put any bills to support missions in the jars in the entryway. The three missions are New Mother's Home in Milwaukee, our new chapel in Thailand, and hunger relief for 4,000 families in Malawi. Uh, and finally, as we take our offering, it's a chance to sign the friendship register in your pew. Uh, if you're a visitor, welcome. Uh, please share any contact information so we can reach out and say thank you. 
With that, we'll take the offering. Please stand as we sing a response. Eternal God and Father, we give you thanks for the blessings we share as members of your holy church, for your gracious word and sacraments, for opportunities to worship and to grow in faith and knowledge, for occasions to serve and be served, for fellowship with believers in our congregation and in our synod. Jesus Christ, Lord of the church, you give grace to your people by calling us to be your witnesses in the world. Open our eyes to see the great and noble mission that lies before us. In the hurting eyes of the lonely, in the pained eyes of the sick, and in the searching eyes of the lost, help us to see your face, O oh Jesus, and to serve others as we would serve you. Holy Spirit, giver of life. Through word and sacrament, bestow on us the wisdom and power we need to witness clearly and to act boldly. Help us to speak the truth in love, to give the reason for the hope we have, and to conduct ourselves with gentleness and respect. Hear us, Lord, as we pray for a family member, an acquaintance, a neighbor, or a friend, who does not believe in you, or whose faith is weak or troubled.
Bless the church with men and women who are willing to proclaim your word in places where we cannot go. Keep them and their loved ones in your care and let nothing hinder their work. By the power of the gospel, restore their spirits each day so that they who do not lose heart as they serve us and others. God of the family, we thank you for joining the hearts of Tommy and Stacy Parker, relatives of Linda Radowitz, who were married in Florida last weekend. Bless them and make them faithful to their wedding vows as husband and wife. Help all husbands and wives to be committed to one another and help them to show kindness, respect, and love toward each other and the people you bring into their lives. Wherever your word is proclaimed, O Lord, grant it success. Let your kingdom come to us and others so that we and many more might join the assembly of saints and angels to sing your praise forever. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. O Lord God, our Heavenly Father, pour out the Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth. Protect and comfort us in all temptation, and bestow on us your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. We close our worship tonight together by singing the last hymn, hymn 745, found on the next page. <laughs>